Oh, hello, and thank you for joining me. I'm Timbo Took, and this is A Joy of Painting Middle Earth, a time when we come together to paint the most fantastic landscapes Middle Earth has to offer. Now, today is a very special day. It's Tolkien Reading Day, March the 25th, and that also happens to be the day the ring was tossed into the fire and destroyed, and Sauron was vanquished from Middle Earth. So, to celebrate, my fellowship, the Tolkien YouTubers, have come together and we're all putting out videos that are celebrating Reading Day. And a special thank you to Dan from The Voice of Geekdom, who's put this playlist together. So, as you watch my video afterwards, be sure to click on the playlist and see fantastic videos from people like Dan at the Voice of Geekdom, Men of the West, History of the Ages, Nerd of the Rings, Tolkien Lore, Clueless Fangirl, Tolkien Tube, Fellowship of Fans, and so many more. But right now, if you're ready, grab your paints and your brushes, and let's go on an adventure. Oh, that's right, I said it was a special day, and today we're going to do something a little different. Normally as I paint, I blather on about what brush I'm using or what paint I'm using, that sort of thing. But I'm not going to do that. I'm still going to paint. I'm going to paint, and while I do that, I'm going to have a special guest read for us. Oh, and here's that special guest now. Oh, look, it's my reading voice. Oh, normally I don't see reading voice. He's just in my head. But now that I do see you reading voice, I must say, you're quite a handsome hobbit. Oh, thank you, Timbo. And I must say, you look like a very humble hobbit. Oh, yes. They might say, I'm the most humble. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, why don't you leave the words to me? And we can get going, because you've probably lost 80% to the viewers already. We may have had some viewers leave, but the important ones have stayed. That's right. And while you've stayed, be sure to give us a thumbs up. That like really helps us out. And after we're done, be sure to click on that playlist and watch what everybody else has in store. For now, I'm going to turn it over to Reading Voice, and I'm just going to paint for you. Have a good day. Okay, so today we're going to be reading because it's Tolkien Reading Day, of course. And the Tolkien Society has put out that this year the passages should focus on hope and courage. I'm sure all of you can see why. Now, I've found one where there's hope and courage, but sometimes you have to look hard, and it comes at a terrible price. So that's what we're going to be reading today. We're going to be reading parts out of Chapter 9 in Book 4 of The Two Towers. She loves Lair. So, I'll start off, and oh, Timbo's gonna paint, and enjoy his painting while I read. Sam on the right, feeling the wall, was aware that there was an opening at the side. For a moment he caught a faint breath of some air, less heavy, and then passed by it. There's more than one passage here, he whispered in an, with an effort. It seemed hard to make his breath give any sound. It's as orc-like a place as ever there could be. After that, first on the right, and then Frodo on the left, passed three or four such openings, some wider, some smaller, but there was as yet no doubt of the main way, for it was straight and did not turn, and still went steadily up. But how long was it? How much more of this would they have to endure, or could they endure? Breathlessness of the air was growing as they climbed, and now they seemed often in the blind dark to sense some resistance thicker than the foul air. As they thrust forward, they felt things brush against their heads, or against their hands, long tentacles, or hanging growths, perhaps. They could not tell what they were. And still the stench grew. It grew until almost it seemed to them that the smell was the only clear sense left to them, and that was for their torment. One hour, two hours, three hours, how many had passed in this lightless hole, 
hours, days, weeks rather, Sam left the tunnel side and shrank towards Frodo. And their hands met and clasped, and so together they still went on. At length, Frodo, groping along the left-hand wall, came suddenly to a void. Almost he fell sideways into the emptiness. Here was some opening in the rock far wider than any they had yet passed, and out of it came a reek so foul and a sense of lurking malice so intense that Frodo reeled, and at that moment Sam too lurched and fell forwards. Fighting off both the sickness and the fear, Frodo gripped Sam's hand. Up, he said in a hoarse breath without voice. It all comes from here, the stench and the peril. Now for it, quick! Calling up his remaining strength and resolution, he dragged Sam to his feet and forced his own limbs to move. Sam stumbled beside him. One step, two steps, three steps, at last six steps. Maybe they had passed the dreadful unseen opening, but whether that was so or not, suddenly it was easier to move, as if some hostile will for the moment had released them. They struggled on, still hand in hand, but almost at once they came to a new difficulty, the tunnel fort or so it seemed, and in the dark they could not tell which way was the wider way, or which kept near to the straight. Which should they take, the left or the right? They knew nothing to guide them, yet a false choice would almost certainly be fatal. Which way is Gollum gone? panted Sam, and why didn't he wait? Smeagol, said Frodo, trying to call. Smeagol! But his voice croaked, and the name fell dead, almost as, almost as it left his lips. There was no answer, not an echo, not even a tremor in the air. He's really gone this time, I fancy, muttered Sam. I guess this is just exactly where he meant to bring us. Gollum, if I ever lay my hands on you again, you'll be sorry for it. Presently, groping and fumbling in the dark, they found that the opening on the left was blocked. Either it was a blind or some great stone had fallen in the passage. This can't be the way, Frodo whispered. Right or wrong, we must take the other. And quick, Sam panted. There's something worse than Gollum about. I can feel something looking at us. They had not gone more than a few yards when from behind them came a sound, startling and horrible in the heavy padded silence, a gurgling, bubbling noise, and a long venomous hiss. They wheeled round, but nothing could be seen. Still as stones they stood, staring, waiting, for they did not know what. It's a trap! said Sam, and he laid his hand upon the hilt of his sword, and as he did so, he thought of the darkness of the barrow whence it came. Oh, I wish old Tom were near us now, he thought. Then, as he stood, darkness about him, and a blackness of despair and anger in his heart, it seemed to him that he saw a light, a light in his mind, almost unbearably bright at first as a sun-ray to the eyes of one long hidden in a windowless pit. Then the light became color, green, gold, silver, white, far off, as in a little picture drawn by elven fingers, he saw the Lady Galadriel standing on the grass in Lorien, and gifts were in her hands. And you, ring-bearer, he heard her say, remote but clear, and for you I have prepared this. The bubbling hiss grew near, and there was a creaking as of some great jointed thing that moved with slow purpose in the dark. A reek came on before it. Master, master, cried Sam, and life and urgency came back into his voice. The lady's gift, the star glass, a light to you in dark places, she said it was to be, the star glass. The star glass? muttered Frodo, as one answering out of a sleep, hardly comprehending. 
Why, yes, why I had forgotten it. A light when all other lights go out. And now, indeed, light alone can help us. Slowly his hand went to his bosom, and slowly he held aloft the phial of Galadriel. For a moment it glimmered, faint as a rising star struggling in heavy earthward mists. And then, as its power waxed, and hope grew in Frodo's mind, it began to burn, and kindled to a silver flame, a minute heart of dazzling light, as though Erendil himself had come down from high sunset paths with the last Silmaril upon his brow. The darkness receded from it, until it seemed to shine in the center of a globe of airy crystal, and the hand that held it sparkled with a white fire. Frodo gazed in wonder at the marvelous gift he had so long carried, not guessing its full worth and potency. Seldom had he remembered it on the road, until they came to the Morgul Vale, and never had he used it for fear of its revealing light. Aya Erandiel Elenian Ankalima, he cried, and knew not what he had spoken, for it seemed another voice spoke through his, clear, untroubled by the foul air of the pit. But other potencies there are in Middle Earth, powers of night, and they are old and strong, and she that walked in the darkness had heard the elves cry that cry far back in the deeps of time, and she had not heeded it, and did not, and it did not daunt her now. Even as Frodo spoke, he felt a great malice bent upon him, and a deadly regard considering him, not far down the tunnel between them and the opening where they had reeled and stumbled, he was aware of eyes growing visible, two great clusters of many windowed eyes. The coming menace was unmasked at last. The radiance of the star glass was broken and thrown back from their thousand facets, but behind the glitter a pale deadly fire began steadily to grow within, a flame kindled in some deep pit of evil thought. Monstrous and ab abominable eyes they were, bestial and yet filled with purpose with and with hideous delight, gloating over their prey, trapped beyond all hope of escape. Frodo and Sam, horror-stricken, began slowly to back away, their own gaze held by the dreadful stare of those baleful eyes. But as they backed, so the eyes advanced. Frodo's hand wavered, and slowly the file drooped, then suddenly released from the holding spell to run a little while in vain panic. For the amusement of the eyes, they both turned and fled together. But even as they ran... Frodo looked back and saw with terror at once the eyes came leaping up behind. The stench of death was like a cloud about him. Stand! Stand! he cried desperately. Running is no use! Slowly the eyes crept nearer. Galadriel! he called, and gathering his courage he lifted up the file once more. The eyes halted. For a moment their regard relaxed, as if some hint of doubt troubled them. Then Frodo's heart flamed within him, and without thinking what he did, whether it was folly or despair or courage, he took the file in his left hand, and with his right hand he drew his sword. Sting flashed out, and the sharp elven blade sparkled in the silver light, but at its edges a blue fire flickered. Then, holding the star aloft, and the bright sword advanced. Frodo, hobbit of the Shire, walked steadily down to meet the eyes. They wavered. Doubt came into them. As the light approached, one by one they dimmed, and slowly they drew back. No brightness so deadly had ever afflicted them before. From sun and moon and star they had been hidden safe underground. But now a star had descended into the very earth, still it approached, and the eyes began to quail. One by one they all went dark. They turned away, and a great bulk, 
beyond the lights reached, heaved its huge shadow between them. They were gone. Master, master, cried Sam. He was close behind, his own sword drawn and ready. Stars and glory, but the elves would make a song of that, if they ever heard of it, and may I live to tell them and hear them sing. But don't go on, master, don't go down in that den. Now's our only chance. Now let's get out of this foul hole. And so back they turned once more, first walking, then running. For as they went, the floor of the tunnel rose steeply, and with every stride they climbed higher above the stenches of the unseen air, and strength returned to limb and heart. But still the hatred of the watcher lurked behind them, blind for a while, perhaps, but undefeated, still bent on death. And now there came a flow of air to meet them, cold and thin. The opening of the tunnel's end at last was before them. Panting and yearning for a roofless place, they flung themselves forward, and then, in amazement, they staggered back, tumbling. The outlet was blocked with some barrier, but not of stone, soft and a little yielding, it seemed, and yet strong and impervious. Air filtered through, but not a glimmer of any light. Once more they charged and were hurled back. Holding aloft the file, Frodo looked, and before him he saw a grayness, which the radiance of the star-glass did not pierce, and did not illuminate, as if it were a shadow, that being cast by no light, no light could dissipate. Across the width and height of the tunnel, a vast web was spun, orderly as the web of some huge spider, but denser woven and far greater, and each thread was as thick as rope. Sam laughed grimly. Cobwebs, he said. Is that all? Cobwebs? But what a spider! Have at em. Down with em! In a fury, he hewed at them with his sword, but the thread he had struck did not break. It gave a little, and then sprang back like a plucked bowstring, turning the blade and tossing up the both sword and arm. Three times Sam struck with all his force, and at last one single cord of all the countless cords snapped and twisted, curling and whipping through the air. One end of it lashed Sam's hand, and he cried out in pain, starting back and drawing with his hand across his mouth. "'It'll take days to clear the road like this,' he said. "'What's to be done? Have those eyes come back?' "'No, not to be seen,' said Frodo. But I still feel they are looking at me, or thinking about me, making some other plan, perhaps. If this light were lowered, or if it failed, they would quickly come again. Tripped in the end, said Sam bitterly, his anger rising again above weariness and despair. Gnats in a net. May the curse of Faramir bite that golem, and bite him quick. That would not help us now said Frodo. Come, let us see what Sting can do. It's an elven blade. There were webs of horror in the dark ravines of Beleriand, where it was forged. But you must be the guard and hold back the eyes. Here, take the star glass. Do not be afraid. Hold it up and watch. Then Frodo stepped up to the great gray net and hewed it with a wide, sweeping stroke, drawing the bitter edge swiftly across a ladder of close-strung cords, and at once springing away. The blue, gleaming blade shore through them like a scythe through grass, and they leaped and writhed and then hung loose. A great rent was made. Stroke after stroke he dealt, until at last all the web within his reach was shattered, and the upper portion blew and swayed like a loose veil in the incoming wind. The trap was broken. Come, cried Frodo, on, on, 
wild joy at their escape from the very mouth of despair suddenly filled all his mind. His head whirled as with a draught of potent wine. He sprang, shouting as he came. It seemed light in that dark land to his eyes that had passed through the den of night. The great smokes had risen and grown thinner, and the last hours of a somber day were passing. The red glare of Mordor had died away in sullen gloom, yet it seemed to Frodo that he looked upon a morning of sudden hope. Almost he had reached the summit of the wall. Only a little higher now, the cleft Kirthungal was before him, a dim notch in a black ridge, and the horns of rock darkling in the sky on either side. A short race, a sprinter's course, and he would be through. The pass, Sam, he cried, not heeding the shrillness of his voice that released from the choking airs of the tunnel rang out now high and wild. The pass, run, run, and we'll be through, through before anyone can stop us. Sam came up behind as fast as he could urge his legs, but glad as he was to be free, he was uneasy, and as he ran, he kept on glancing back at the dark arch of the tunnel, fearing to see eyes or some shape beyond his imagining spring out in pursuit. Too little did he or his master know of the craft of Shelob. She had many exits from her lair." But nothing of this evil which they had stirred up against them did poor Sam know, except that fear was growing on him with a menace with which he could not see, and such a weight did it become that it was a burden to him to run, and his feet seemed leaden. Dread was round him, and enemies before him in the pass, and his master was in a fey mood, running heedlessly to meet them, turning his eyes away from the shadow behind and the deep gloom beneath the cliff upon his left. He looked ahead, and he saw two things that increased his dismay. He saw that the sword which Frodo still held, unsheathed, was glittering with the blue flame and he saw that though the sky behind was now dark, still the window in the tower was glowing red. Orcs, he muttered, we'll never rush it like this. There's orcs about, and worse than orcs. Then, returning quickly to his long habit of secrecy, he closed his hand about the precious file which he still bore, red with his own living blood, his hand shone for a moment, and then he thrust the revealing light deep into a pocket near his breast and drew his elven cloak about him. Now he tried to quicken his pace. His master was gaining on him. Already he was twenty strides ahead, flitting like a shadow. Soon he would be lost to sight in that gray world. Hardly had Sam hidden the light of the star glass when she came. A little way ahead and to his left, he saw suddenly, issuing from a black hole of shadow under the cliff, the most loathly shape he had ever beheld, horrible beyond horror, of an evil dream. Most like a spider she was, but huger than the great hunting beasts, and more terrible than they because of the evil purpose in her remorseless eyes. Those same eyes that he had thought daunted and defeated, there they were, lit with a fell light again, clustering in her outthrust head. Great horns she had, and behind her short stalk-like neck was her huge swollen body, a vast bloated bag swaying and sagging between her legs. Its great bulk was black, blotched with livid marks, but the belly underneath was pale and luminous and gave forth a stench. Her legs were bent with great knobbed joints high above her back, and hairs that stuck out like steel spines at each leg's end there was a claw. As soon as she had squeezed her soft, squelching body, 
and its folded limbs out of the upper exit of her lair. She moved with a horrible speed, now running on her creaking legs, now making a sudden bound. She was between Sam and his master. Either she did not see Sam, or she avoided him for the moment as the bearer of the light, and fixed all her intent upon one prey, upon Frodo, bereft of his file, running heedless up the path, unaware yet of his peril. Swiftly he ran, but Shelob was swifter. In a few leaps she would have him. Sam gasped and gathered all his remaining breath to shout. Look out behind, he yelled. Look out, master, I'm... But suddenly his cry was stifled. A long, clammy hand went over his mouth, and another caught him by the neck, while something wrapped itself about his leg. Taken off his guard, he toppled backwards into the arms of his attacker. Got him, hissed Gollum in his ear. At last, my precious, we've got him. Yes, nasty hobbit. We takes this one. She'll get the other. Oh, yes, Shelob will get him. Not Smeagol. He promised he won't hurt Master at all. But he's got you, you nasty, filthy little sneak. He spat on Sam's neck. Fury at the treachery, and desperation at the delay when his master was in deadly peril, gave to Sam a sudden violence and strength that was far beyond anything that Gollum had expected from this slow, stupid hobbit, as he thought him. Not Gollum himself could have twisted more quickly or more fiercely. His hold on Sam's mouth slipped, and Sam ducked and lunged forward again, trying to tear away from the grip on his neck. His sword was still in his hand, and on his left arm, hanging by its thong, was Faramir's staff. Desperately, he tried to turn and stab at his enemy, but Gollum was too quick. His long right arm shot out, and he grabbed Sam's wrist. His fingers were like a vice, slowly and relentlessly, he bent the hand down and forward, till with a cry of pain, Sam released the sword and it fell to the ground, and all the while Gollum's other hand was tightening on Sam's throat. Then Sam played his last trick. With all of his strength, he pulled away and got his feet firmly planted. Then suddenly he drove his legs against the ground and with the whole force hurled himself backwards. Not expecting even this simple trick from Sam, Gollum fell over with Sam on top and received the weight of the sturdy hobbit in his stomach. A sharp hiss came out of him, and for a second his hand upon Sam's throat loosened, but his fingers still gripped the sword hand. Sam tore himself forward and away, and stood up, and then quickly he wheeled away to his right, pivoted on the wrist held by Gollum. Laying hold of the staff with his left hand, Sam swung it up, and down it came, with a whistling crack on Gollum's outstretched arm, just below the elbow. With a squeal, Gollum let go. Then Sam waited in, not waiting to change the staff from left to right. He dealt another savage blow. Quick as a snake, Gollum slithered aside, and the stroke aimed at his head fell across his back. The staff cracked and broke. That was enough for him. Grabbing from behind was an old game of his, and seldom had he failed in it. But this time... Misled by spite, he had made the mistake of speaking and gloating before he had both hands on the victim's neck. Everything had gone wrong with his beautiful plan, since that horrible light had so unexpectedly appeared in the darkness, and now he was face to face with a furious enemy, little less than his own size. This fight was not for him. Sam swept up his sword from the ground and raised it. Gollum squealed, and springing aside on all fours, he jumped away in one big bound like a frog. Before Sam could reach him, he was off running with amazing speed back towards the tunnel. Sword in hand, Sam went after him. For the moment, he had forgotten everything else but the red fury in his brain and the desire to kill Gollum. But before he could overtake him, Gollum was gone. Then, 
as the dark hole stood before him and the stench came out to meet him, like a clap of thunder, the thought of Frodo and the monster smote upon Sam's mind. He spun around and rushed wildly up the path, calling and calling his master's name. He was too late. So far, Gollum's plan had succeeded. Chapter 10 The Choices of Master Samwise Frodo was lying face up on the ground, and the monster was bending over him, so intent upon her victim that she took no heed of Sam and his cries, until he was close at hand. As he rushed up, he saw that Frodo was already bound in cords, wound about him from ankle to shoulder, and the monster with her great forelegs was beginning to half-lift, half-drag his body away. On the near side of him lay gleaming on the ground his elven blade, where it had fallen useless from his grasp. Sam did not wait to wonder what was to be done, or whether he was brave or loyal or filled with rage. He sprang forward with a yell and seized his master's sword in his left hand, then charged. No onslaught more fierce was ever seen in a savage world of beasts, where some desperate small creature, armed with little teeth alone, will spring upon a tower of horn and hide that stands above its fallen mate. Disturbed as if out of some gloating dream by a small yell, she turned slowly with the dreadful malice of her glance upon him. But almost before she was aware that a fury was upon her greater than any she had known in countless years, the shining sword bit upon her foot and shore away the claw. Sam sprang in, inside the arches of her legs, and with a quick upthrust of his other hand, he stabbed at the cluster of eyes on her lower head. One great eye went dark. Now the miserable creature was right under her, for the moment out of the reach of her sting and her, her claws. Her vast belly was above him with its putrid light, and the stench of it almost smote him down. Still his fury held for one more blow, and before she could sink upon him, smothering him and all his little impudence of courage, he slashed at the bright elven blade across her with desperate strength. But Shelob was not as dragons are. No softer spot had she save only her eyes. Knobbed and pitted with corruption was her age-old hide, but ever thickened from within with layer upon layer of evil growth. The blade scored it with a dreadful gash, but those hideous folds could not be pierced by any strength of men, not though of elf or dwarf should forge the steel, or the hand of Baron or of Turin wield it. She yielded the stroke, and then heaved up the great bag of her belly high above Sam's head, poison frothed and bubbled from the wound, now splaying her legs, she drove her huge bulk down on him again. Too soon, for Sam still stood upon his feet, and dropping his own sword, with both hands he held the elven blade point upwards, fending off the ghastly roof. And so Shelob, with the driving force of her own cruel will, with strength greater than any warrior's hand, thrust herself upon a bitter spike. Deep, deep it pricked, as Sam was crushed slowly to the ground. No such anguish had Shelob ever known, or dreamed of knowing, in all her long world of wickedness. Not the doughtiest soldier of old Gondor, nor the most savage orc entrapped had ever thus endured her, or set blade to her beloved flesh. A shudder went through her, heaving up again, wrenching away from the pain. She bent her writhing limbs beneath her and sprang backwards in a convulsive leap. Sam had fallen to his knees by Frodo's head, his senses reeling in the foul stench, his two hands still gripping the hilt of the sword. Through the mist 
Before his eyes he was aware dimly of Frodo's face, and stubbornly he fought to master himself and to drag himself out of the swoon that was upon him. Slowly he raised his head and saw her, only a few paces away, eyeing him, her beak drabbling with spittle of venom, and a green ooze trickling out below her wounded eye. There she crouched, her shuddering belly splayed upon the ground, the great bows of her legs quivering as she gathered herself for another spring, this time to crush and sting to death, no little bite of poison to still the struggling of her meat, this time to slay and then to rend. Even as Sam crouched, looking at her, Seeing his death in her eyes, a thought came to him, as if some remote voice had spoken, and he fumbled in his breast with the left hand and found what he sought, cold and hard and solid it seemed to his touch in a phantom world of horror, the file of Galadriel. Galadriel, he said faintly, and then he heard voices far off but clear the crying of the elves as they walked under the stars in the beloved shadows of the Shire, and the music of the elves as it came through his sleep in the hall of fire in the house of Elrond. Gilthaniel, I Elbereth! And then his tongue was loosed, and his voice cried in a language which he did not know. I Elbereth Gilthaniel! O Menel Palandiriel, Le Nalin Si Dingurothos, I Tironin Fanulius. And with that he staggered to his feet, and was Samwise the Hobbit, Hamfast's son again. Now come, you filth, he cried. You've hurt my master, you brute, and you'll pay for it. We're going on, but we'll settle with you first. Come on, and taste it again. As if his indomitable spirit had set its potency in motion, the glass blazed suddenly like a white torch in his hand. It flamed like a star, leaping from the firmament, sears the dark air with intolerable light. No such terror out of heaven had ever burned in Shelob's face before. The beams of it entered into her wounded head and scored it with unbearable pain, and the dreadful infection of light spread from eye to eye. She fell back, beating the air with her forelegs, her sight blasted by inner lightnings, and her mind in agony. Then, turning her maimed head away, she rolled aside and began to crawl, claw by claw, towards the opening in the dark cliff behind. Sam came on. He was reeling like a drunken man, but he came on, and Shelob cowed at last, shrunken in defeat, jerked and quivered as she tried to hasten from him. She reached the hole and, squeezing down, leaving a trail of green-yellow slime, she slipped in even as Sam hewed a last stroke at her dragging legs. Then he fell to the ground. Shelob was gone, and whether she lay long in her lair nursing her malice and her misery, and in slow years of darkness healed herself from within, rebuilding her clustered eyes, until with hunger, like death, she spun once more her dreadful snares in the glens of the mountains of shadow. This tale does not tell. Sam was left alone. Warily, at the evening of the nameless land, fell upon the place of battle, he crawled back to his master. Master, dear master, he said, but Frodo did not speak. As he had run forward, eager, rejoicing to be free, Shelob, with hideous speed, had come up behind, and with one swift stroke had stung him in the neck. He lay now pale and heard no voice and did not move. Master, dear master, said Sam and through a long silence waited, listening in vain. 
Then, as quickly as he could cut away the binding cords and laid his head upon Frodo's breast and to his mouth, but no stir of life could he find, nor feel the faintest flutter of the heart. Often he chafed his master's hands and feet and touched his brow, but all were cold. Frodo, Mr. Frodo, he called. Don't leave me here alone. It's your Sam calling. Don't go where I can't follow. Wake up, Mr. Frodo. Oh, wake up, Frodo, me dear. Me dear, wake up. Then anger surged over him, and he ran about his master's body in a rage, stabbing at the air and smiting the stones and shouting challenges. Presently he came back and bending looked at Frodo's face, pale beneath him in the dusk, and suddenly he saw that he was in the picture that was revealed to him in the mirror of Galadriel and Lorien. Frodo, with a pale face, lying asleep under a great dark cliff, or fast asleep he had thought then, he's dead, he said, not asleep, he's dead. And as he said it, as if the words had set the, the venom to its work again, it seemed to him that the hue of the face grew livid green. And then black despair came down on him. And Sam bowed to the ground and drew his gray hood over his head and night came on to his heart and he knew no more. When at last the blackness had passed, Sam looked up and shadows were about him. But for how many minutes or hours the world had gone dragging on, he could not tell. He was still in the same place, and still his master lay beside him. The mountains had not crumbled, nor the earth fallen into ruin. What shall I do? What shall I do? he said. Did I come all this way with him for nothing? And then he remembered his own voice speaking the words that at the time he did not understand himself at the beginning of their journey. I have something to do before the end. I must see it through, sir, if you understand. But what can I do? Not leave Mr. Frodo dead? unburied on the top of the mountains, and go home, or go on, go on, he repeated, and for a moment doubt and fear shook him. Go on, is that what I've got to do, and leave him? Then at last he began to weep, and going to Frodo, he composed his body and folded his cold hands upon his breast, and wrapped his cloak about him, and he laid his own sword at one side, and the staff that Faramir had given at the other. If I am going to go on, he said, then I must take your sword by your leave, Mr. Frodo, but I'll put this one to lie by you, as it lay by the old king in the barrow, and you've got your beautiful mithril colt that old Mr. Bilbo gave you. And your star glass, Mr. Frodo. You did lend it to me, and I'll need it, for I'll always be in the dark now. It's too good for me, and the lady gave it to you, but maybe she'd understand. Do you understand, Mr. Frodo? I've got to go on. But he could not go on. Not yet. He knelt and held Frodo's hand and could not release it. And time went by, and still he knelt, holding his master's hand, and in his heart, keeping a debate. Now he tried to find strength to tear away and go on a lonely journey for vengeance, 
If once he could go, his anger would bear him down all the roads of the world, pursuing until he had him at last, Gollum. Then Gollum would die in a corner. But that was not what he had set out to do. It would not be worthwhile to leave his master for that. It would not bring him back. Nothing would. They had better both be dead together, and that too would be a lonely journey. He looked on the bright point of the sword. He thought of the places behind where there was a black brink and an empty fall into nothingness. There was no escape that way. That was to do nothing, not even to grieve. That was not what he had set out to do. What am I to do, then? he cried, again. And now he seemed plainly to know the harder answer. See it through. Another lonely journey. And the worst. What? Me? Alone? Go to the crack of doom and all? He quailed still, but the resolve grew. What? Me take the ring from him? The council gave it to him. But the answer came at once. And the council gave him companions, so that the errand should not fail. And you are the last of the company. The errand must not fail. I wish I wasn't the last, he groaned. I wish old Gandalf were here, or somebody. Why am I left all alone to make up my mind? I'm sure to go wrong. And it's not for me to go taking the ring, putting myself forward. But you haven't put yourself forward. You've been put forward. And as for not being the right and proper person, why, Mr. Frodo wasn't, as you might say, nor Mr. Bilbo. They didn't choose themselves. Ah, well... I must make up my mind. I will make it up. But I'll be sure to go wrong. That'll be Sam Gamgee all over. Let me see. If we're found here on Mr. F or Mr. Frodo's found, and that thing's on him, well, the enemy will get it. And that's the end of all of us. Of Lorien and Rivendell and the Shire and all. And there's no time to lose or it'll be the end anyway. The war's begun, and more likely things are going the enemy's way already. No chance to go back to it and get advice or permission. No, it's sit here till they come and kill me over my master's body and gets it, or take it and go. He drew a deep breath. Then take it it is. He stooped down very gently. He undid the clasp at the neck and slipped his hand inside Frodo's tunic. Then, with his other hand raising the head, he kissed the cold forehead and softly drew the chain over it. And then the head lay quietly back again in rest. No change came over the still face, and by that, more than by all other tokens, Sam was convinced, at last, that Frodo had died and laid the quest aside. Goodbye, Master, my dear, he murmured. Forgive your Sam. He'll come back to this spot when the job's done, if he manages it, and then he'll not leave you again. Rest you quiet till I come, and may no foul creature come anigh you. And if the lady could hear me and give me one wish, I wish to come back and find you again. Goodbye. And then he bent his own neck and put the chain upon it, and at once his head was bowed to the ground with the weight of the ring, as if a great stone had, had been strung upon him. But slowly, as if the weight became less, or new strength grew in him, he raised his head, and then, with a great effort, got to his feet 
and found that he could walk and bear his burden. And for a moment he lifted up the file and looked down at his master. And the light burned gently now with the soft radiance of the evening star in summer. And in that light Frodo's face was fair of hue again, pale but beautiful, with an elvish beauty, as of one who is long past the shadows, and with the bitter comfort of the last sight, Sam turned and hid the light and stumbled on into the growing dark. Oh, there you have it. Oh, that's hope and courage from Samwise. Now, as we go through this reading, we all can think about someone that we've lost along the way. And while we know it was different in the story, for some of us in life, we've lost someone who's very important to us. And it takes hope and courage to find the strength to go on. But that's what we do. And for all of you who've struggled through this past year, it takes great strength, great hope, and great courage to keep going. I pray that for you, that you have that hope and that courage in your life. I thank you for joining me on this Tolkien Reading Day. And be sure to check out the other channels, of course, my friends, as they give you other words of hope and courage and encourage you in many ways. Goodbye, and God bless.